recording again. So welcome back, everyone. I hope you made some lunch. Um, and uh, we're rounding off our, our three-day CIADA workshop and the second half of our joint shock ERIS at CIADA workshop focused on heritage science. And we've got two papers from very different sides of the spectrum, I think, of heritage science, which uh, demonstrates some of the the challenges we're facing in grouping this together, but we'll show the range of quite exciting stuff that heritage science embraces. So it's my pleasure, first of all, to introduce my colleague, Jesse Hendy, from the Department of Archaeology at the University of York. Jesse's lecture in paleoproteomics in the BioArt group, uh, focusing really on uh, ancient protein analysis, uh, looking at past dietary consumption, practices and, and diseases. So, uh, Jesse, you're going to be talking about challenges in practice using molecular biology as a lens, please. So if you'd like to go ahead. Great, thank you so much. I'll just um, share my screen. Oh, don't want to change the language. How was that? Can everyone see and hear me okay? Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> Great. Um, thanks so much, Julian, for the introduction and also to Julian and Holly and to others for putting together this workshop. I, I know it was a real challenge to transition to being online and I think you've just done an amazing job of making everything run so smoothly and facilitating all these conversations. Um, so as Julian said, my name is Jessica Hendy. I'm an archaeological scientist based at York and data deposition and data management is not something that I actively work on as a research question in itself, but through my own research, working in different institutions, working with different researchers, producing different kinds of data, I've come to think about some of the challenges in the production and management of these different biomolecular data sets and have also witnessed firsthand what can happen when different researchers have different ideas about how data can and should be managed. So I hope that I can share some of those experiences. So in my presentation, I'm going to discuss the different kinds of data that these biomolecular methods produce and the current state of the art surrounding the data management for each of these different approaches. And I'm going to focus on four techniques, ancient DNA, ancient protein analysis, stable isotope analysis, and organic residue analysis. I'll then spend some more time talking about um, the challenges and ideas for future work surrounding the data management of, the, of these different fields, but particularly of ancient DNA, as I feel that this is a field in particular that's been grappling with some ethical challenges that have come to light, especially in the last couple of years. So the application of biomolecular methods is becoming more routine in archaeology with different labs and different archaeological units using these techniques more as um, standard practices. And such, of the, such techniques include the analysis, stable isotope analysis of human and animal remains. This involves the identification of particular chemical isotopes such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and strontium to investigate patterns of diet, ecology and migration in animals and humans. The identification of fats or lipids from material objects, especially ceramics, is a, is a blanket technique, um, which is termed organic residue analysis. Uh, and this involves uh, extraction of biomolecules, um, particularly fats and lipids from especially ceramic vessels to understand um, the contents of past, of past vessels and what different kinds of material culture was used for. And for example, it's been really revolutionary in changing our, our understanding of ancient dairying practices. Ancient proteins, perhaps less well applied, but I would like to say growing because I'm a lecturer in paleoproteomics, uh, is uh, the identification um, of proteins from different kinds of, of archaeological substances um, to investigate diet, disease, and also for, for taxonomic identifications of different kinds of biological remains. Um, another technique related to this is one called zoo archaeology by mass spectrometry, and it's a very uh, quick and uh, cheap technique where you can identify fragments of animal bones or, or other kinds of material culture to identify their, their biological species of, of origin. And ancient DNA really hardly needs any introduction, um, but has been, of course, revolutionary in 
in telling us about population histories and ancestry, relatedness, kinship, um, and is really ever, ever expanding in scope. And the fundamental point here is that each of these different techniques have their own data requirements, data types, and also best practices. So beginning with stable isotope analysis, what this technique produces is essentially a single data point with, a, with an error. It's a, just a numerical value per sample um, along, alongside an error. And this um, data is typically made available at the point of publication, either in text or as a supplementary data file. And some standards for this were recently published um, by Patrick Roberts and a, and a group of researchers working in this field, um, which went over and articulated some of the um, requirements or, or best practices for data, data handling and data production. Sometimes data is deposited in multi data set repositories, um, which facilitate broader scale analysis. So here is an example of ISOMEMO, which is um, uh, the main one. And ISOMEMO brings together data from different groups across the environmental sciences, across archaeology, climate sciences, in order to ask big questions um, from stable isotope data. So it enables much bigger questions to be asked if everyone is contributing um, their different data sets. So with organic residue analysis, the analysis of, of fats or, or lipids, data are produced from gas chromatography and mass spectrometers. Uh, here is an example of what the output looks like. It results in a series of peaks on this kind of spectra with each of these different peaks representing a, a different molecule identified. And organic residue analysis can also involve a second step which is the isotopic analysis of each of these molecules. And what this does is tells you a bit more about the, the biological origin of those particular kinds of molecules. This underlying uh, raw chromatographic data is typically not shared, but these lists of molecules that were identified are shared. Um, this is often, uh, but not always, presented in, in text or tables or as supplementary files along with um, manuscripts of publications. Um, oftentimes they're just available in figures, which often make it quite hard to extract that, that information and make it a bit hard to compare to, to other data sets. And I would argue that there isn't really an adequate data deposition strategy for this particular kind of analysis. There, um, there are some groups that have uh, different data accessibility strategies, but these are often quite refined or confined to um, their own institutions. With ancient protein analysis, this also involves the production of these spectra and the identification of that spectra into protein identifications. This produces two sets of corresponding files, a, a raw file and a processed file. Um, and it's current practice to make available these two different kinds of data sets, both a raw data set, which is completely unmodified, and also the modified data set, which is basically how you make your data interpretations. And in, this, in a sense, we have it quite easy here because these data types are really universal in the field of molecular biology. There's nothing different about them because they are produced um, from, from archaeological data sets. So what this means is that um, these uh, ancient protein data sets can be easily integrated into existing platforms such as the Proteome Exchange, which is hosted by the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, or Massive, which is hosted by the National Institutes for Health in the US. It's very easy to draw on these existing repositories. For this technique I mentioned called Zoom, Zoo Archaeology by Mass Spectrometry, for a growing technique um, amongst archaeologists, this data production is slightly different. It involves the production of characteristic fingerprints, which are diagnostic of particular species. So this is an idealized example of, of how this data looks like. And uh, in publication, it's typical to list um, the, the masses, the peaks that were identified, these different molecular components. Um, but again, there's not really a standard practice with how these are, this information is, is distributed. So with ancient DNA, it's quite similar to ancient proteins. Um, it, there's a production of sequencing files, both a raw file and a, and a processed file is typically what is shared and deposited. 
Um, and it, again, you can draw on existing data repositories in order to share this data. So this uh, includes um, GenBank, which is funded by the US National Institutes for Health and the European Nucleotide Archive. Um, and these enable the, the deposition and distribution of these sequencing files. There are databases that do exist exclusively for ancient DNA, uh, including the online Ancient Genome Repository, which is hosted by uh, the University of Adelaide, supported by the Australian National Data Service. But it's very, very common for, um, as I think uh, Lisa maybe mentioned before, that to have these um, these data files um, adopting already existing systems in, in the field of molecular biology. So as you can imagine with the growth of the field of ancient DNA and alongside that the simultaneous reduction in the cost of ancient DNA sequencing, this has resulted in a massive amount of data being produced and distributed. And as you can see here, um, this refers to the number of individ ancient individuals analyzed in this, um, this field is ever increasing. And as this is happening, it's producing uh, you know, a lot of, lot of data. So depositing ancient DNA data is very commonplace and a study published in 2013 showed that 97% of, of ancient DNA papers had their underlying data available. And even though this was published in 2013, this observation, I think that's still a very similar number now, very standard practice. And I think that there are three reasons why ancient DNA as a field has made the data so accessible. One is that ancient DNA studies, proteins as well, are able to utilize existing platforms that are already set up to handle this kind of data analysis in, in, in terms of the data format, but also the data size. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel with the publication of these studies. The second point is that many journals, uh, many publications, including high impact journals like Nature and Science, that ancient DNA um, studies often target, um, require data as part of open science initiatives and yeah, given that many ancient DNA papers are published in these journals, it's probably influencing their data deposition strategies. And I think thirdly, sharing data is commonplace for ancient DNA as a legacy to do with concerns about contamination and authentication. During the early days of the field of, of ancient DNA, um, when it was discovered that some of the earliest reported results were in fact from contamination, there was a real push to publish underlying data to make it open for scrutiny. And as the, papers, the, the author of, of this paper um, points out, it was really the openness of people to distribute this data that contributed to overcoming those doubts about the, the credibility of the field. Recently, there's also been a drive to not just distribute the underlying raw data, but to make available the specific laboratory practices behind its production, as well as the bioinformatics strategies used to, to process it. Uh, so this information is often distributed in methods, sections of papers, um, but uh, um, what these platforms do is enable much more uh, detailed information to be distributed. So in terms of laboratory work, this might include the, the distribution of laboratory protocols in, um, from protocols.io, uh, and researchers have also turned to um, GitHub or Bitbucket or similar um, code sharing repositories for sharing their bioinformatic strategies. So the archiving and sharing of ancient biomolecular data is important for many different reasons, some of which might be very obvious. Firstly, it enables a, a thorough analysis of a study's interpretation and a quality assurance, um, both at the time of peer review and, and after peer review. So for example, it's common with ancient protein and ancient DNA studies to make uh, all underlying data available privately to reviewers uh, and then also publicly at the time of publication. So this enables a scrutiny of the data by the reviewers um, during peer review. So this is just an example of a screenshot uh, of a cover letter which makes, uh, indicates that raw data has been made available. Um, secondly, it enables the uh, replication of data analysis during and after peer review. So this is, for example, uh, useful for people who are trying to establish a new method of, it, of data analysis. And thirdly, it enables uh, non-institute specific uh, long-term data storage. So for example, I myself have moved in different institutions and the fact that I've made data available on these external platforms means that I don't have to worry about potentially losing access to that data, that raw uh, research data uh, when I move institutions.
Having centralized platforms available for certain types of data means it's relatively easy for researchers to make comparisons to what has been previously published and newly generated data. So for example, this is a PCA showing the degree of a genetic relatedness between different individuals. Each different um, point on the on the what's called a PCA plot here is a different individual. And uh, underlying the colored dots is a suite of previously published data pertaining to the ancestry of individuals across Eurasia. And the colored dots represent ancient individuals analyzed in this particular study. So by drawing on all this published data set, researchers are able to relatively easy, easily compare how closely the individuals in their study um, match to, to say reference populations to look for similarities in uh, genetic relatedness. And lastly, having good data archiving strategies enables uh, future researchers to analyze data again when new strategies are developed. So for example, ancient protein analysis relies heavily on a comparison with different reference, uh, with reference databases. It's really a core part of the, of the data analysis. And previously generated protein um, data files can be reanalyzed as these reference databases continue to be updated. So for example, this is a screenshot down the bottom of recent accessions that have been entered into um, what's called the Uniprot database, a very big database that is used in protein data analysis strategies. So as these strategies, as these um, reference databases get updated, it, it opens up new kinds of research questions from these um, references that are now available. So the production, archiving and reanalysis of biomolecular data is not without its challenges. And the first thing to say is that produced data anal analysis files can be very, very large. And what can happen is that only institutions that have sufficient computational power can work with this data, which can lead to an imbalance of certain institutions dominating the field, which is the course of phenomenon that has parallels in other areas of, of research. Related to that data can also be highly specialized, meaning that its interpretation requires very particular expertise in order to be able to critically interpret it. And these, these two points together really mean that there are only three or four labs in the world which are able to make these kind of quality assurances to do with the production of this kind of data. And then it means that because there's only three or four labs, these labs often become intense rivals or collaborators, which mean that then you know the degree of that quality assurance becomes potentially problematic. And some of these tensions have recently been articulated in this article. It's a, it's a journalistic article, but I think it's really well researched, um, published in the New York Times, which argues that the, this concentration of funding and resources in just three or four ancient DNA labs is, is very detrimental to this scientific community, um, which is, again, you know, has parallels in other fields as well. It's definitely happening, happening here. So to remedy this, one suggestion is to spend more time and energy investing in approaches to make the specialized and large biomolecular data more user-friendly. So for example, this is the work of James Fellows Yates. He's at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Jena, and he has developed an interactive web tool which enables a researcher to explore their data set without having to perform in direct coding or downloading very large data sets. So, um, this is a tool designed for the analysis of what's called metagenomic data. So it's looking at multiple different species, not just one, one species like a human, multiple different species. And so here you can explore what kinds of species were identified in your sample. So the different kinds of bacteria, for example, and also different kinds of statistics about each sample. So how chemically damaged the DNA was and how fragmented it was, which is really important to know when assessing ancient DNA um, authentication. So this still requires some knowledge about ancient DNA, of course, to understand what these statistics mean, but it's a much more user-friendly way of sharing data and enabling researchers that are not necessarily based at that institution to um, explore their data sets. But on the flip side to that, there's also the danger that um, then ancient biomolecular analysis becomes a bit of a black box where end users are not necessarily forced to deal with the complexities of that data analysis because they're looking at this I guess more of a, um, the front end of it. And a third challenge is that I've witnessed that there can be a real lack of communication about what data are produced and what is the field's norm for its distribution. So for example, the extraction of pathogen DNA from human teeth uh, as, a, as a technique uh, where um, one analyzes a uh, 
a tooth from a, from a skeleton and tries to identify what kinds of bacterial DNA is, is um, preserved in it that might be related to a disease that this person was suffering from. And as you're doing this DNA analysis, human DNA from that individual is also simultaneously extracted. And it may not be appropriate to publish or share this corresponding human DNA data, um, you know, uh, for, for various reasons, you know, protection of that, um, of the ancestry of that individual, or there's a host of reasons why that human DNA data might not be appropriate to distribute. And I think that collaborating partners and stakeholders, they need to be aware through conversations with if they're working with researchers on these kinds of questions about how this data is acquired and that it might be, might be considered standard to, to share that data. So just to sum up here, there are uh, multiple options available for, for data deposition um, in uh, the fields of ancient biomolecules with some centralized platforms already available and, and utilized for, for some techniques, but for not necessarily others. And I would say data sharing at the point of publication is the norm rather than the exception. And this stems from the legacy of a field hampered by, by inauthentic data. Um, and then in my opinion, more research should be focused on making data sets more user friendly and not necessarily exclusively of, of interest to just a few, a few research groups, which I know is a challenge beyond just ancient DNA alone. And um, that data deposition should, should form part of dialogues and research projects that are applying biomolecular methods, um, as particularly to raise issues that may be of concern prior to any particular data generation. So I'd like to finish by um, thanking Holly in particular, and also other members of, of the group and also the various colleagues that have had these conversations with and do feel free to get in touch um, by email if you have any questions that, that go beyond this, um, this workshop. Thanks very much, uh, Jesse. You can see there's a virtual round of applause going on from those that have got their, <laughs> uh, their cameras on. Um, yeah, that, that was a really um, useful insight and uh, sort of window into a world that's quite different, I think, for many of us in, in Ciada. Um, not sure if we've got many archaeological uh, scientists on the, on the line. Maybe they're prepared to, to comment. But what I propose we do is because there's quite a few specific questions come up in the Google Doc is we'll perhaps have a look at those and we can adjust the timing into because we've got a, a generous slot at the end for for discussion so yeah see Scott's happy with with that that we'll uh, uh, deal with uh, questions to your paper first so there's a sort of first grouping um, about linkages really from from the sorts of databases you showed uh, to others clearly there's sort of you demonstrated sort of lots of links to the sort of scientific community outside uh, sort of archaeological science but um, Peter McKee commented about the importance of how of making links between scientific data and then the related archaeological sites or objects and sort of the sorts of data I guess that that Canmore in Scotland or sort of ADS for for England might might hold in other repositories. Um, not sure. Peter did you want to comment on or do you have any thoughts on how that might be achieved? Um, I think it's just a case of making sure you've got a, an ability to map uh, to a related resource preferably through a persistent identifier or some such uh, certainly we find it very handy uh, we find it very handy to be able to to, to um, link the radiocarbon database that, that that had been developed by historic Scotland to the Canmore records it gives us a lot more flexibility in answering public inquiries so people want to know everything I, which sites have got uh, prehistoric or Neolithic radiocarbon dates we can we can download the the, the scientific the the data about the radiocarbon date and we can then uh, just by, by mapping to the, the, the Camor identifier, uh, pull out the grid references, uh, classifications, that kind of thing, and then people can use that in the CSV, take it and do what they like with it. Lisa, did and, you? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to add on to that as well, because um, thank you, Jessica, for that. I thought that was phenomenal. Um, so I work quite a lot with people doing ancient DNA and um, isotope studies and, and various other things. 
Um, and I thought, um, linking to what Peter said about radiocarbon, um, myself and Alison Sheridan from the National Museums of Scotland put together a whole database of all of the ancient DNA that's been undergone on Scottish material. And so we're look at the moment, it's completely not user friendly in any way because it's just a big list and uh, uh, that's available online. And so one of the things that Peter's helping with is the, the linked data. So how, what's the best way of putting this into Canmore and making it accessible but obviously we don't want to host all of the um all of the sequencing documents and things like that so it's encouraging people to put things into things like GenBank and then linking into them so um so I thought that's quite interesting and so we're trying to do that through Canmore but that's more Peter's expertise than mine but um yeah it is it is a tough one I would also add that uh, by not having these the, the, these data sets linked to the, the sort of the uh, site inventory uh, records and things, uh, you end up with people creating multiple independent databases of this information secondhand and the uh, temporary status. So there's a lot of duplication of effort going on. Mm, that's an interesting point. Can I um, have a little bit of a response there? Mm, and just to say that I completely agree as well. It's not. Maybe my presentation was a little bit focused on what happens with the raw data, but what happens to that, that metadata and, and that information about associated information about each sample is also incredibly important. And certainly I've witnessed even um, institutions that don't necessarily, um, for whatever reason, have, have records of what samples are going in and out of their institution have it certainly resulted in um, researchers and making the same analysis twice, which is then or even multiple times, which has then re resulted in chaos, you know, down that line. Mm. Um, so having that, you know, all that metadata available is, I think, really important. And I think also working super closely with, with museum collaborators or archaeological collaborators, um, especially if you're, um, you know, to make sure that the right kinds of accessions are recorded and the information is distributed so then people can, you know, link together which samples have been, have been utilised or which individuals have been utilised across multiple studies. I think it's really Absolutely. And, and I think it's a, there's, there's a bit of an ethical question in there as well, because we've had, we've had quite a lot of um, students from all of the UK wanting to sample human remains that are either within the care of HES or, or ones that, that, that we've done through our emergency call off contract. And, um, and we're kind of having to force people into sharing their data between each other rather than sampling mm. something to destruction, which unfortunately um, is happening at the, at the moment. So we're mm. having to, to try and um, avoid that happening from an ethical perspective as well as any mm. other kind of duplication of effort. Jesse, you, you, you commented about um, some of these databases being changed and updated and I wondered how that, that tied in with the idea of the sort of preservation of the data at one point do they do they create a new edition or, or I mean I'm thinking if you're trying to reference something I saw some of the the date uh, I think Proteome Exchange had DOIs but I, would, I wasn't sure that ISO mean did and whether things might might change so how we how that would impact on this linking idea yeah, you're right. Um, uh, uh, in many different data repositories, they are issued a, a DOI. Um, and when I, I guess, when I was talking about databases being updated, I just mean, I guess, more accessions being being entered. So it's not necessarily changing a, a version or changing a, a format or changing a, a data type or something like that. It's just more accessions being being entered. Um, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not too sure about how. Um, you know, the, the big repositories like the European um, Molecular Biology Lab deal with with updates um, and, yeah, how that's, how that's factored in. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's something we find more broadly sometimes in archaeology is how you, you reference a particular item in a database as well, rather than the database as a whole. I guess it's sort of how granular you can go with your, your DOIs. And, oh, right. Yeah, I think it's um, quite variable between the different um, repositories. Yeah. I don't think ISOMEMA, for example, has has a DOI. I think that's more it's more acting as a repository for then asking new questions of a, a larger data set. Yeah, yeah. But I think that 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 is perhaps something then. Well, we picked it up in our our ERIS recommendations about the importance of, of having DOIs or another form of of, of stable URI. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's some other uh, questions. Well, Keith, I think, was answered to see he was asking about linkages to other biological sciences, which you, which you show. But then you asked Keith about, yeah, this is interesting, what, what raw and processed data actually looks like in 
in your domain? And what, um, what would you preserve? What's the key, what's the significant thing to to? Yeah, so I, I'll speak to protein analysis, which is where those terms raw and processed data um, are most pertinent, perhaps. Um, so I would define raw data as the data that has not been data that's come off the instrumentation, the, the mass spectrometer, for example, and has not been processed in in any way. It's just what the what the instrument has has spat out in its most raw form. And then the process data is then how the researcher then has modified that data in order to get to the particular interpretation they want to get, get to. Um, um, yeah, how, how the data has been bioinformatically processed, trimmed um, to be suitable to the research question that was that was posed of it. So, um, for example, the raw data is typically um, lists and lists of of peaks and um, kind of like a massive text file, basically. Um, I mean, maybe this like is a bit technically an ASCII, an ASCII file. Would it be like like geophysics has raw ASCII data, and then they have the process data. I mean, that's what I'm. I'm sorry, without going too far into the nerdy, what's the format question? <laughs> I, I think I might have maybe missed your question there. Sorry. I I, I kind of. The, I kind of was drawing on my more, my more familiar experiences. Geophysics has raw and processed data, so, but they always argue that it's really critical to keep the raw data. But then they always get into these arguments of how raw is raw, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Particularly for reuse, and it's a it is an issue because you get then you also get how often is it reprocessed? So it might go through fifteen different small amendments and then you get into quite big headaches for my colleagues at ADS over which is the finally processed bit and which is the initially raw bit. Sorry that was a complicated <laughs> interruption but it, it was the crux of the question. Mm -hmm. No I think that there are parallels are parallels there but I would say that the, the what's presented say in, alongside a publication is the data that was then used for that final interpretation and then um, you know it would be quite poor practice to put up process data files which then are not exactly the ones that you used for your final analysis but it's not <laughs> yeah certainly things go through multiple iterations you know of, of data analysis um, but yeah I, I would say that having that raw file of course is really important but then ultimately it's the file that then you were use, using to draw your interpretations okay th thanks uh, so yeah, thanks. Is, uh, then the sort of next question well there's one from from alpha which i think also ties into some comments that adam uh, lunovich is is adding at the at the bottom there because uh, alfie asks well is the should, do you think that there should be a single repository for bioarchaeology to allow the crossover of subfields, um, DNA and RNA, for example? Um, or is, is there scope to create some more standardised meta schema for bioarch to enable data harvesting? And then Adam was commenting, well, what should be the best practice for contributing isotopic results? Because he's sort of saying there seems to be a multiplicity of, of repositories, I, I think. So do you put everything everywhere or, or um, yeah, what's the, do you have any recommendations for us? I could see a, a database um, of metadata being useful, but not necessarily data repositories of, of DNA or RNA or protein data, because those existing repositories are already so well established and the data types maybe are quite specific or also quite large. So then how, you know, how would those be hosted? Um, but certainly metadata would be, I think, very valuable. And um, so for, for example, about what Lisa was saying about how um, institutions curating um, their samples to, to keep track of, of what analysis is being performed. You know, when you've got multiple different analyses being performed on the same, say, human individual of, of human remains. So that kind of database, I think, could be extremely important. And I'm sure iterations of, of such a database already do exist. So do you, I, I'm just, Wondering here, I don't know if you're familiar with the sort of work that we've been doing uh, on Ariadne, which uh, yeah. I think was mentioned earlier, we're ex trying to extend to uh, 
to archaeological and biological sciences if they if sort of metadata aggregators like that and i guess at shock at a, at a higher level which would link us across to the uh, to, to eos and some of the hard sciences um that if if they aggregated metadata and agreed on on the sorts of mappings that 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 doug talked about earlier in the meeting but for the science data is that the the way to go um possibly i suppose it depends on on the the reason for the, the composition the compilation of that data because so for example i can see that for particular institutions it, it would be extremely valuable to to have this particular information about their collections and i'm sure that there are um databases which already exist in-house um but certainly to be able to say make comparisons to look at um research bias sampling bias would be um extremely interesting and warranted mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you yeah i think that is something that we should uh, explore um and we, we can take a couple more i think so i think we'll ignore keith's question about whether there's a multi-extract data repository i think that's slightly uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, <laughs> um but there was a sort of side discussion about uh GitHub and Bitbucket and Keith, do you want to uh, say something about that? I'm not sure what you were whether that was you were proposing. I, yeah, no, I mean it's a it's a broader issue than Jesse's one really, but it, it 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 just reminded me that it's something we've wrestled with a number of research council projects that I've been involved with. Doug, I don't Doug two votes on here at the moment. But we had questions around what we deposited with ADS and what we did with the code for some of the research demonstrator type things. And, and we we put that, you know, best kind of best practice was to put stuff on GitHub. But I'm still, you know, I suppose with my historic England hat, I'm trying to wrestle with what kind of guidance is best practice to to the people that we fund, for instance, if we actually do get fun projects where they create some level of code and holly mentioned this in the context of algorithms yesterday and I, i've talked to the other people about this question of how do we actually keep that kind of the i swear the code they the, the the i can't express it very well but i guess it, it's almost the historical documentation behind how you got the results and if we only put that there's a, to me that seems a chance something that we need to think about going forward is, is keeping the connections between that I can see Judith switched on because I know internet archaeology have really tried to get this connection between the data papers and, and of course that's the advantage of why I publish in internet archaeology that you can put the data and the paper together but it's less and I'll let Judith speak I think that's less about the actual code you know there's an element of black boxness about what ends up on github and what actually gets published so I'll, sh I'll stop now because that wasn't a very good question uh, well yeah all i was going to say on that is that yes you're right the journal does try to link these things through together but there's a concept that i've come across and i think it's come from medicine really where they they talk about this concept of threaded publication and i don't know if there's a digital i don't know if there's a technology there that's able to help us with this but it's a way of linking together those protocols and the data and the publications so that people can follow that thread right the way back to the start you know uh, for an idea or a you know something at the, at the at the inset but then also look at everything that's followed on from that so i don't know if there are technology out there are technologies out there that can help us with that but that's that's just what came to mind when you were when you were speaking and doug's popped up as as well though you're muted, Doug. Sorry, <laughs> this I got to mute, unmute. There's interest recently in platforms combining data and code um, so that you're, you're actually able to um, link them together and to show dynamic results. It's still a bit experimental. So platforms like Jupyter, for example, um, it's, in, in, it's sort of in that way. I see that the link someone put to the Harvard um, PDF document on, I don't know if that was uh, Jessica uh, or it was a reference to a, a Harvard document on um, uh, uh, um, fair data. 
Uh, and it has uh, taught, I see it talks about container support uh, use cases, uh, combining data and code. I see that code ocean, Jupiter. So I think it is a kind of current emerging interest. Thanks, yeah, I think it was Ron Decker added that uh, at Harvard uh, link earlier. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, have we, we talked about the black box, the, the sort of last question that popped up, how is the community addressing the tension you mentioned between providing a tool so a larger number of members can analyze the, uh, the data, but limiting black box understanding of the analysis that's built into the, the tool. Is that something you would like to respond to, Jesse? To be honest, it's not something that people I think are really dealing with at the moment. And I think that's because um, the data is still so specialised, being analysed by a few different labs. Um, I'm not sure if that's really a question that people are really engaging with, um, to be honest. And, but I think that, that it should be engaged with. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, thanks, thanks very much again for that. I do hope uh, you can uh, stay. Sorry, is there I, I, I was just going to raise my hand to respond to what the, that last question and what Jessica was saying. One place where we can see how this kind of effect plays out is in the um, commercial genetic repositories that the general public is using, right? Where you have a black box and then it gives you a thing that says, here is your ethnic heritage, right? And then people immediately misinterpret it. <laughs> so that, that problem is one that we can see in action in these other um, in these other venues, and that we should probably take our cues from the problems that emerge in those venues when we try to figure out how we should um, manage things that are available to non-specialists without creating false impressions. Mm, yep, just amazing. want to say I completely agree with that with that observation. Yeah, I think those. So it's a great example. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you, Adam. Okay, um, sure, we can always return to some of these things at the end, but uh, can we move on then, please, to really, the, as I mentioned, the sort of opposite end of the spectrum, maybe, of, of heritage science and, uh, and Scott from engineering and uh, uh, climate change effects on buildings. So would you like to, to share your screen? Go ahead. As long as I can manage to figure out how to, more than happy to do so. That's the... The challenge, isn't it? Yeah. How is that? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank Great. You. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. Um, and I have to say that this is similar to Jess's approach, which is that uh, I also am not actively researching in this area, although I do teach in it uh, on, a, on a master's course right now. So I really am trying to also bring the perspective of someone who has encountered some of these challenges in the past uh, and has thought about ways in which we might address them. Um, so in no way do I claim to be an expert and I really do hope that as has been the case for the rest of the program today, this is a basis for discussion and for starting controversy. Um, what I really wanted to do was point out some of the ways that researchers can change what they're doing now or think about the immediate future in order to move towards these things. And I think uh, Shock and Sayada and Iris are all very long-term thinking uh, you know, blue sky thinking initiatives that are really trying to make a change in the future. And I'm just trying to suggest ways in which individuals and projects and researchers might make small changes in order to move toward that. And also think about what kind of skills and ideas we should strive towards and perhaps what skills as a whole are lacking within the heritage science and archaeological science communities. Uh, some of the things that I mentioned are probably quite basic. Uh, and some, interestingly, I think, contrast the current draft of the E-RISC guidance. So it'll be really interesting to see what people think about some of those points as they arise. So all I wanted to do was do, have, do a little bit of thinking about data in the context of archaeology and heritage first, and just think about how that might be different than in the other areas. So what makes heritage science and archaeological sciences a bit different? Uh, then I wanted to talk a bit about, uh, in that context as well, what it means to repurpose data and who we might be thinking of as the potential user or reuser uh, in those contexts. Then I want to share a few examples of what I think uh, could be good or best practice uh, from my own experiences and uh, from others. 
And then I wanted to introduce a concept that I don't think has been spoken about today. And it'd be interesting to know uh, if it's been spoken about uh, in the past two days. And if it has, you know, ad nauseum, then do feel free to tell me and I can skip a bit quicker through it. But the idea of five-star open data, which is actually a concept put forward by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, and then I'm also really glad to see that there was discussion about analysis. Uh, and I think this idea of combining data and the analysis and the protocols and the procedures uh, is quite interesting. So I wanted to share some of the best practice that might go along with the analysis of, of data as well. So I was trying to think about the relationship between data stewardship and data reuse. And I think they are very inherently related. And so a lot of the best practice that goes along with data stewardship, as I understand has been the focus of the past two days, is very similar to reuse. Um, but in trying to think about data management for reuse, I think the main intention is that it's oriented towards comprehension. Uh, and there's three types of comprehension or aspects of comprehension that I think are important. Uh, the first one being that people can accurately understand what the data is and where it has come from uh, and all the caveats that go along with it. And as well, that they can do that efficiently. Uh, and then it's a transparent process. And transparency and openness maybe have slightly semantic differences and I'm not sure I've thought enough about the, the difference. And the best way that I thought to try and summarize some of these things was to think about the reuser of data as your future self. So, you know, in some sort of non-denominational equivalent of the golden rule, you know, thinking about yourself returning to this data in five years and asking what you would have liked to know uh, or what you had forgotten and what you could have done in the original incarnation to, to think about those things. So I was also trying to think about in the context of this being uh, partially sponsored by Eris, uh, Eris, what is specific to scientific data? So what makes it perhaps different than some of the other archeological data formats or uh, data that is more purely in the social sciences or humanities disciplines and traditions? And I think which is probably true about scientific data is that it is generally uh, produced by computers, but it's also equally interpreted by humans and computers. And that has quite a specific outcome and implication from when we start to think about how to store it for reuse and how to curate it and manage it for reuse. And that those two groups, uh, humans and computers, interpret data and indeed information and any other level of thinking hierarchy very, very differently. Uh, I also think when it comes to scientific data, there's an impossibly wide range of formats. Uh, and that's true, especially, I mean, it was nice to see uh, what, what a nice community can bring to, and come together when they have very similar data formats. And there's a fairly small number of groups that seem to be doing the work. Uh, as heritage science comes, being an incredibly broad umbrella for so many things, uh, there's just an incredibly wide range of formats. But on the benefit, that data is usually structured. So in terms of being able to think about how it might be interpreted by humans and computers, we have the benefit of being able to understand that if the structure can be formulated properly, then we can think about the reuse and the curation and the general analysis and perhaps reanalysis in the future. I also think that this data can be of staggering scale. And one of the examples that comes to mind here is thinking about some of the high resolution imaging techniques that are often used to capture uh, different aspects of, of works of art or any other form of heritage. And when you think about the fact that you can do image scanning or imaging for a few hours, and generate hundreds of gigabytes of data from one single object at one single time period, uh, you, I think you can start to see that the scale is a challenge, both from the physical aspects of how to store that data and how to afford that storage without being energy intensive, uh, but also how you think about different reuse and different end users. And I was really glad to see that came up earlier, and it's something I'm going to return to in a bit. And I think perhaps with, with scientific data and heritage science and archeological science data specifically, the power is in the interconnectivity of them. I think it's very rare that you find a heritage science project that has used one technique. And perhaps that also brings a challenge, but it's an opportunity in that typically these techniques are combined. Uh, and we look at things through different lenses, through different uh, disciplines uh, and the tools they bring. And that's really where the power is. So thinking about how you reuse scientific data in order to enable that, I think is something that has to be thought about. And as I already mentioned, thinking about analysis. So how to actually think about how to interrogate that data. And that's something I will uh, come back to. Uh, 
So I was just trying to throw out different types of data that we might encounter uh, that was scientific data in heritage and archaeology. Um, and I've already mentioned the example of scientific imaging. Uh, I think there's a huge tradition as well of uh, the chemical sciences and the analytical techniques. Um, and, and they bring about their own specialties often. I think that's especially an area that is ripe with proprietary formats and the challenges they bring. Um, I also think there's a large component of environmental monitoring, and that's probably one of the ones which is more easily facilitated because even high resolution uh, environmental data doesn't tend to be that large in size and it's fairly easily stored in very basic formats and there's a long tradition of doing that uh, that's kind of been inherited from meteorological sciences and indeed there's probably a really good realm of best practice that can be explored there and then perhaps on the other side there's a bit more about the the collection records and i wouldn't i wouldn't exclusively say that's metadata but it is um, information about collections and, and the curation they've undergone since being in, in care. Uh, there's also a huge world of born digital assets, and I'm not going to be the person to claim to know a lot about those or to have thought a lot about them, but I think they bring their own sets of challenges. Uh, and I put this last one as ND representations, see them 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D. And I think those data formats, especially on the scales of scanning uh, physical environments, for example, with terrestrial laser scanning. Uh, of archaeological sites or indeed of entire built structures or cities. Um, the scale there and the formats bring their own challenges. Um, we've talked a lot about metadata today and I think metadata is crucial to understanding data. Obviously it tells us about the structure of data that we're being provided in a reuse point of view and it also tells us about the administrative aspects of it so that might include the rights for example, we talked about the ideal licenses that eRES would like to put into his recommendations and the management of that data. But one of the things that I think is particularly important when it comes to heritage science data and, and indeed archaeological sciences as well is the idea of paradata. And this is all the, data, all the information of the data by which the data was collected. And the reason I think this might be perhaps of, of more relevance to heritage science than other areas is because there is often this combination of social science and humanities data with the scientific data. And an example of this might be a group that was surveyed um, in, in those traditions. And you might think about um, trying to characterize that group in a way that is respectful of privacy concerns uh, while still being able enough that someone could look at that data and understand what the intentions, the biases and the potential gaps of those data sets would be in order to supplement that in the future. From a scientific point of view, I can also think of several examples in which understanding who collected the data and where is incredibly important. So I might think about uh, imaging of artworks in situ as opposed to in laboratory environments or the use of very temperamental non-destructive sensors in the built environment. Uh, and they can give entirely different readings in different orders of magnitude depending on who is collecting it because they're so dependent on specific factors of use. So I think the paradata is something that might um, I'd be very interested to hear people's thoughts on, on the role of paradata and the importance of it and what aspects you might think of as being important in, in heritage and archaeological sciences. I also think that um, perhaps, especially in heritage science, there are a great range of reuses of this scientific data. And unlike most scientific disciplines, perhaps controversially, I'll put out the idea that the primary end reuser is not just other scientists in similar or adjacent fields. And I think this comes down to the fact that heritage science has three broad categories of activities. And I'm pulling these out of the most recent uh, strategic framework for heritage science in the UK that was published last year by the National Heritage Sciences Forum that we talked about earlier. And these are broadly put into conservation and management. And that's probably where most of the um, most of the mind goes to in the earliest sense of, of heritage science. We also have this interpretive one. So how can we learn more about heritage and understand its process of manufacture, of uh, change, of, of different activities through that? And then perhaps this last one is the most interesting one because it covers the umbrella of engagement. And engagement is often undertaken by people who may be out of those traditional scientific disciplines. And that's a, a category of, of reuse where those questions of skills and ability to analyze and interrogate complex scientific data are especially relevant. And the kind of formats of data they might be interested in would be very different um, 
in several ways compared to the data formats that would be of interest to other scientific reusers. So I just wanted to throw out some ideas here about uh, best practice. And some of these will be very obvious, I'm sure, to most people that are attending. Uh, perhaps some are not. Um, I think this discussion between proprietary and open or plain formats uh, is quite interesting. And I think there, there is a temptation to oversimplify and say that we should only be using open formats. Now, I'm not say, I, I fully agree that proprietary formats have risks associated with them nor do I believe in corporate monopolies on scientific data. But I think one of the questions or several questions that should be asked when it comes to proprietary data is, is there data that will be lost if you save it in an open or alternative format? And if there is, why not save it in both? Um, as well, I think there's lots of examples here where um, there's an argument for using them if the softwares are ubiquitous in the field. So if the primary reuse of the data is in one specific community who all have access to the same softwares. Can you perhaps save people time and homogenize the processes of analysis by using the proprietary format while still ensuring that you're looking at long-term security and longevity by storing in those alternative open formats? And indeed, there are historical precedents where previously proprietary formats have now entered the open domain. And uh, for example, Word documents being one example of that. Um, I also just wanted to think about um, go challenging that aspect of scale when it comes to data and thinking about headers. And I think they're incredibly important. And if you have thousands and thousands of data files or whatever scale you're working on that all might have the same header information, do you include them or do you not? And how can you put that alongside the data to make sure that they are uh, incorporated or linked without being lost? And I quite like the idea of the, the eternal column. And I think if anyone else has opened a spreadsheet or a data file before and seen a column of entirely identical data, it's very tempting to remove it. And I think before you do that for management, think, is there a reason to keep them? And either because there's aspects of human assumptions that may go wrong if you don't include that, uh, does it belong in the metadata? But from the interpretation of computers side, maybe when we think about softwares, you have to think about uh, the data format that software, either proprietary or open, will read into that. And are the existing algorithms and codes that interrogate those data types and data structures going to be expecting that column to be there? So again, I think it's just about balancing the potential reusers and interpretation when it comes to humans and computers, and just not trying to jump to any conclusions because you're worried about the space or the, uh, the cost associated with the storage of these types of data. And I was really glad to see that uh, Jessie mentioned in, in her primary area of work that uh, they tend to archive both the processed data and the unprocessed data. And perhaps the reason to think about archiving the unprocessed data, and as Keith mentioned, there's a challenge to do with what the unprocessed step is. And having worked with geophysical data myself, I, I can relate to the 15 steps, um, but I think Archiving the unprocessed data enables the widest varieties of types of reuse from a scientific point of view. Now that may not address the other types of end users that I mentioned when it comes to engagement. These are also quite small things, but if anyone has had to deal with them before, you'll be, um, you'll be pleased to know that they are, are in this section very briefly. And I think these are all just little things that we can do now as researchers and project um, participants to think about these things. Dates uh, can be easily organized in numerical orders by using this very simple format regarding other, other data formats as easily convertible for metadata presentation and for human interpretation. Um, one of the other challenges is knowing how many samples you may have or how many records you might have. How many leading zeros is too much? So I don't know if anyone else appreciates that ORC IDs currently have an incredible number of leading zeros because they're anticipating future users. Uh, but in order to keep them in some sort of sequence that makes sense. And uh, often from the computer interpretation point of view, um, spaces and file names present a particular challenge. So thinking about other ways that you might present that information. So thinking about the kind of three main alternatives, underscores between words or terms, that camel case in which each separate component of the name has a capital letter, uh, or also introducing dashes between components instead of spaces. And you can see here, one of the reasons why computers may hate these is that some programs are written really badly to parse numerical ordering. Uh, 
you can see here I've tried to order several text files for, for LaTeX um, compilation. And it's really frustrating to put my closing file in the middle because one zero comes after one, depending on the way you structure your organization. Um, I just wanted to share some examples of this. And I think given that this is, uh, many of these are European level initiatives, it's important to make sure people are aware of the risks associated with floating points and decimal points and units. And certainly there are cultural differences between those. Uh, one of the stories that I like the most that demonstrates some of the challenges of this is where people might make assumptions about units if they're not explicitly stated and put into headers. Um, perhaps uh, someone here recognizes the artistic rendering of the Mars Polar Lander. And unfortunately, at a loss of, I think it was about 158 million US dollars. Um, and the investigation realized that the reason there had been a fatal error was that one team had worked in US standard measurements and the other in metric units. Um, if that had been, you know, that, that's a case where this wasn't about reuse, but I think it demonstrates the risk that is posed in reuse and perhaps even exacerbated by reuse if the teams that were not originally involved uh, are, are then interrogating new data types. This is something that I came across recently and perhaps the rest of the world was incredibly aware of these issues. And I have to say naively that I wasn't. Um, but there are various file formats that we should think about when it comes to lossless and loss files. And this introduces some issues, I think, when it comes to thinking about the widest possible range of reusers. So um, there are several formats that for reasons of compression and size, or simplicity, uh, compressed data, and they lose information. And some of these actually lose information each time they're opened. I, I think JPEG is an example of that. Um, so probably from the scientific reuse point of view, the lossless file formats are the ones that you want to think about. Um, perhaps it's not surprising that there's raw and TIFF files are uh, the two most common of that when it comes to image types. Uh, PNGs are also in that, as long as they're reversible types, you have to make sure about that. Um, and BMP is actually a fully proprietary format, although it is lossless, and there's really no reason to use it to begin with. However, these files do have a larger storage requirement, and in terms of wider reuse and thinking about uh, engagement and perhaps artistic reuse, uh, these users may be much more familiar in some ways to JPEG and GIF files. Um, I also recently learned that GIF files can only maintain um, 256 colors without loss. And after that, then they simplify the color palette. And that's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think the point here is that when you're thinking about how to store data, uh, there's no point in having collected lossy format data and then converting it into lossless format as the data has already been lost. And there's really no point, you'll eventually get a much larger file that has exactly the same information as the smaller lossy file. So thinking about how you collect this in the first instance really is about how you can encourage the widest potential reuse. This is the, the slide that I wanted to spend a bit of time on. And this, as I mentioned, uh, is the idea of five-star open linked data. And it was proposed quite some time ago by Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And it really is kind of like a pyramid of climbing up uh, in terms of making your data open and available and linked on the web. And I think when it comes to thinking about skills in the heritage and archeological sciences, we're probably at about three stars. And you'll see what I mean when we get there. Uh, so basically the idea of one star open data is that you have made things, data available on the web in whatever format under an open license. And you might say, great, we have fulfilled funders requirements, the data and the metadata is up there, maybe some analytical tools as well, and it's under an open license. And as someone who is consuming that data, you can look at it, you can store it, and you can even move it to a different system, change it and share it. But an example of this might be like data printed in a PDF. So you can't really do anything with the data unless you're willing to manually crawl it or convert it. When you think about two-star uh, web data, you think about opening it up as structured data. So instead of it being locked in a PDF or an image, uh, if it's numerical data, for example, you might think about putting it into a CSV file or an Excel file. Now, all of a sudden, from the consumer point of view, uh, you can export it to another format as well as doing other processing on that. Um, and as a publisher, it's still fairly easy to make available, uh, but the data is still locked up in a document and you may find that file format is proprietary depending on what you've selected to store it in. So 
the way to very quickly get to three stars as opposed to two stars is to make it available in a non-proprietary open format. So you might think about using CSV instead of Excel. Now, some of the caveats of that might be that you may need converters or plugins to export the data from a proprietary format. Um, now, the data is available on the web and everyone can use it, but it's still data on the web and not data in the web. And that's been the, the big difference. I'd say this is probably where most people have the skills to get to within scientific communities. They could upload Excel or CSV files fairly easily and put some metadata on there. Um, I think when we start going to four-star web data is when we start looking, um, start getting a bit higher up. So the idea of four-star data is that things have uniform resource indicators, URIs, uh, very similar to uh, persistent identifiers, but actually they identify common points that can be looked across uh, different databases. So for example, a work of art might have a URI that could be searched across several databases. And I think this is where the skills start to, to fade off in these scientific areas right now. So uh, thinking about the tools needed to provide XML templates uh, from the researcher and scientist point of view and understanding an RDF graph, the structure that's ideal for this is quite complicated. Um, and the final one is really a small step up from four and that's linking your data to other data to provide context. And perhaps that's something that uh, Eris is, is thinking about and needs to think about uh, in the future. I just wanted to show people, maybe this is really um, quite known, but one of the best examples that I found that could be adapted for scientific data in the broadest sense in the context of heritage science is this XML data format from the Open Geospatial Consortium. And they have XML schemas that are for a range of general scientific data, and I've included some of them here. Uh, but there's also uh, other ones which include uh, timescale data spectrum for any sort of analytical technique. And perhaps there is something to learn from uh, this open consortium or other ones uh, that have looked at how you address a huge range of scientific types of data in one sort of schema or database. Um, and just if anyone else hasn't spent time looking at uh, XML databases, you know, this is a simple representation of a Boolean, of a true or false. And so you have all of the associated uh, XML schema that's required. And then at the very bottom, highlighted in yellow, you've got the false. It's just, um, it's a, the format may not look like we think about how we format our own scientific data in research projects or in other activities. And just one quick thing that I had learned about here, the difference thing between XML formats uh, and RDF formats is that uh, XML can be quite ambiguous. So the first two formats that I've presented here are equally valid forms of XML. Whereas when you think about RDF formats, uh, they're much more flexible and you can easily add different um, components to an RDF file where an XML file has an agreed rigid schema that is harder to adapt and that's agreed by the community. Uh, and the URI there means that it can be easily linked to other databases. I just wanted to spend the last five minutes thinking about the analysis methods and perhaps how we think about some of the best practice for reuse when it comes to things like code and algorithms. And I think the algorithms are not just code, they're also the procedures. And so I was really glad to see that Jesse mentioned those as well. And that includes analog and digital procedures, as well as the ones that are manual and automatic. Again, I think for people who are really embedded in code, um, are probably very used to seeing these things and they're quite basic. But for people who are getting started, uh, these are really best practice that should be encouraged. Uh, so I've included an example here where uh, it's a simple set of functions to read a certain data file uh, from a non-destructive sensor commonly used in building surveying. And the best thing that you can do for reuse, especially for an end user that maybe isn't very savvy in writing their own code, is include a very simple example, which is shown here in the first few lines of green text of how to use this. So if you point towards your directory and you tell it what file name you want to use, this is how you can get the data into what in this case is R to look at. And for some end users, they won't have to open the functions. As long as they know how to execute R code in a very basic way, this could be enough to get them to producing analytical results and visualizations of that data. Without that sample use, it takes a lot more digging and interpretation of those files in order to understand how to use them. This is a particular case where I'd like to commend someone for the excellent code documentation they did. Um, 
I did a lot of work with non-destructive sensors. And one of the things I was particularly interested in was how to model electromagnetic spectra and how electromagnetic waves are reflected and propagated through complex different layers of media. It turns out this is a really common activity, but primarily in the electronics and electronic engineering world. And therefore, all of the calculators that are available online operate in very high frequency ranges, uh, have a limited range of values that are relevant to the materials they use, and often are built on scales that I couldn't even fathom. So as opposed to working on a facade and thinking in centimeters and meters, they were working on nanometer thicknesses. But I did find this one tool, which had implemented all of the complex calculations into a JavaScript program online. And now the problem was this tool had been uh, taken down from the web since originally published, but it was in the Wayback Machine on archive.org. And all the JavaScript file was behind it. Another limitation of this was that it only allowed a single output. So every time you wanted to get a reflectance value out of it, you had to change the number, run it, and then copy and paste it. So what I was able to do, because this person had um, been an incredible um, annotations, was that I was able to convert this into a language that I actually could work with and also automate that over different values that I was interested in. And some of the things that I like to pull out here is that uh, they tell you what each step does. So the first yellow highlighted portion initializes those arrays and they've included units to make sure in the second one that you know what uh, your input should be in. And I also quite like that this person has uh, understand the conditions of use uh, and explain the context. And that you know, I like that this may be complex if in the case of your incident meeting and it's also complex. Uh, and it explains the options that you have and the assumptions that have been taken in order to write this code. So it's not just about explaining the steps or including units, but actually building in your assumptions and your process of analysis and the more human interpretive side of it into code can be a very powerful way of ensuring it has a life in, in reuse. This has already been spoken about and we've gone to examples uh, directly from GitHub, but I'm sure that everyone in this, in this session has a folder that looks like this. Uh, I think we, we always tend to think we're in the final version. And I think using the, the you know, open source softwares like Git, which is implemented into GitHub, is essential uh, for anyone. And it can even be done in similar ways for non-code documents and not in the cloud. Uh, but thinking about version control and how we store data effectively and man monitor and track changes in the ever-growing, expanding world of data is, is really important. And just a few final points. Uh, this one is about structure and it's about best practice. And if anyone else has written lots of code, you've got a file somewhere that has 4,000 lines. And at the beginning, you start with the title and the date and at the end, you get the analysis you want out. And it's a really ineffective way to actually think about the reuse of code and analysis, especially if someone is only interested in part of it. So best practice says that each script is one step and that it should be operating on a single subject. And then you have one configuration or master file to run them. And one thing that's particularly useful is to keep multi-use components in a central place. So for example, this uh, file that I showed earlier to read this sensor data uh, is stored in a central folder. And anytime I do a project that involves that data set, I use it and, and I call it from there. And if I do any make, make any changes to the file here, it doesn't affect, uh, actually it can equally affect all of the other implementations of it. And this is just the last piece of advice which, which has burned me before. Um, don't trust someone else's code. And above that, you should never trust your own code. Um, I once got to the second stage of review in a paper before realizing there was a fundamental unit error because I didn't ask myself what units of wind the meteorological office would work in. It turns out they work in knots, if you'd like to know. Um, and there's an, there's an interesting just final point here. I think I'm taking an extra minute and I hope that's all right, Julian. Uh, which is that thinking about how you save the intermediate results of each script. So this is generally given as best practice. Um, and there are some caveats on that. One of which is that it's incredibly useful to save the intermediate results if your processing takes a long time. So if you have data that takes a few days to be processed on, on high powered servers, the one thing you don't want to do is get to the end final number and then ask yourself, I wonder if this was okay in that step. Uh, but this is not necessarily that important if the analysis is quick. So if you're looking to space to say sport storage, you can balance that against the time it takes to interrogate the data. And if it's only in a few minutes or on a similar timescale, then perhaps it's not as important. 
and there are general limitations of, of storage and memory. And plotting these intermediate results can be an excellent way to track whether or not your analysis is robust. And, and that supports the, the reuse if you're more confident in sharing your tools and your analysis methods for reuse later on. Um, and that we should all be thinking about deleting superfluous files, not because it saves space, but because it actually helps someone who may be reusing this data in the future to better understand what is essential and what is not. I've got two files here in a recent project and I have literally no idea what they do and if they're important. And if someone else comes along and deletes them, it may actually turn out that I was lazy and that's an incredibly important file in the analysis procedure. Uh, and there's a risk associated with that. I also just wanted to think about the types of tools that people might use. Um, and there's certainly a balance that has to be struck here between existing packages that can be useful for data typologies and the tools that use them and thinking about your, your future self or a wide range of users. Uh, and I've always been very weary about MATLAB uh, in the costs associated with them and the institutional licenses that are needed to analyze data with it. And to think about your future self and if there's a risk that you may not have access to the tools or the data sets, you know, just as Jesse mentioned that uh, putting data on archives and repositories allowed her to access it across institutions. Similarly, using open source tools to analyze your data will not only help other users, but can also potentially help yourself if they're moving between uh, different institutions or there's a risk of losing your access to those proprietary tools that you need for analysis. So the final points I wanted to make here is that these are all things that I have also neglected to do. Um, and they are indeed best practice and they take time. And when I think you're pressed for deadlines or research, it's easy to overlook them. But I think thinking about the best practice and why you should be striving towards them and thinking about reuse is that not only do they meet funded requirements, but they do foster and make future use more efficient, you would hope. Uh, they improve the robustness of current work and they support collaboration, both in current use and reuse. Uh, they save time and they avoid awkward and sometimes quite serious mistakes. Uh, so thank you for the extra minute or two. I think we'll leave time for questions now. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Scott. Um, uh, yeah, if you'd like to stop sharing your uh, screen there, we can start to uh, end discussion. So yes, yeah, thank you for, for taking us back to uh, some of the very practical aspects of uh, the reuse to enabling better reuse of, of data. It's never bad to be uh, reminded of, of, of these. Um, I have added a, a link into the Google Doc to the um, ADS uh, guides to, well, we, they're good practice rather than best practice maybe, but the, these have been sort of, you might find it interesting to look at them, that they've been sort of gathered through the international sort of community really over the last sort of 20 years. And they sort of relate to, to a number of the things that you've uh, spoken about there, I think. You might, might also, um, you were talking about the, the, the five star uh, uh, principles as well, or whether the, yeah, I forget the, the, uh, the, the term, the, the five star data uh, thing. There's the, uh, in that context, this is more recent work that uh, Dance, the uh, uh, Netherlands data archive have been mm. doing based on the FAIR principles, where they're now trying to develop a scoring system for how FAIR uh, data, individual data archives are. So they're sort of, I think, taking forward some of those mm. things. We'll, we'll add in a link to, uh, to that as well. Um, so um, just seeing if there are any specific questions, uh, Wolfgang, made a comment about, because we've heard a lot about Paradata, in fact, over the last three days. I don't know whether your comment was slightly facetious, Wolfgang, or whether you wanted a, a genuine answer as whether this is a new cool thing and whether provenance is now no longer needed. No, a... actually, I wanted an answer. Um, I'm a little confused because um, everyone seems to use this term now and I haven't heard it uh, until two days ago. And it seems to comprise data provenance, but it seems to mean more. Yes, I'm a little confused. Yeah, I think it's like the term metadata about 10 years ago became really widely abused and meant everything from the sort of metadata your digital camera captured to the to uh, much higher level things. Who wants to uh, to 
to answer Wolfgang on on definitions of paradata and 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 how it differs. I I don't want to. My my understanding, and I will not claim to be an expert in this, um, but I have used the term now in print, so I have to <laughs> at least pretend that I know what it means. Um, is that it it retains more of the human and social dimension of the context of production of data. Wolfgang, so I think of data provenance as being more on a computational level, the series of transformations. And this paradata, I think, incorporates that, but it also incorporates some of the social and cultural factors involved in the both the production context and the um, producers themselves. Yeah, I think, I mean, Jeremy, I don't, I don't think he's any longer with us, but I think it incorporates some of the the things that he's been talking about as sort of hampering uh, data reuse, the lack of paradata, yeah. Um, so thanks, Adam. And it, before we move on to the general discussion, are there any uh, uh, final questions specifically for, for Scott? Okay, right. But I don't want to sort of prolong the workshop unnecessarily, but there's a sort of few things to draw together and also a couple of things um, hung over from earlier today. And I think uh, Keith asked an interesting question in case he's, he's lost sight of it on his, his screen, I'll, I'll read it out. I'm interested in people's experience of issues about speed and openness a publication of scientific data and circumstances for embargoes among scientists in sharing data openly, other than the more obvious ethical uh, issues. Um, yeah, um, don't know. Maybe, maybe I, if if Jessie doesn't mind, I'll because it's perhaps her field in some ways. Whether you, you might like to comment on on that and, and when you think embargoes are uh, are needed. So I guess in terms of speed, I'll just talk about ancient DNA or papers, really. And we would say that the typical practice is to make the data available at the time of peer review privately. So it's embargoed publicly at that point. Um, and then um, it gets released alongside the publication when it's published. Um, does that answer your question or is there more kind of nuance to that that I'm <laughs> not getting? No, I mean, that, that's a good answer because you have a better answer than, than probably many other disciplines. I, I think in a way I, I, I've, I'm not highly experienced in your field, but I, I'm more impressed. And I, in fact, it's going back to a slide I had in Seattle, my, one of the slides I've used, where I've always sort of said that in bio, for argument's sake, bioinformatics are much better at, putting out data the most disciplines I've come across in terms of a sort of the little bit where you know I work with colleagues in Fort Cumberland be like Ruth Pellin and co that that have tried to put data out um, and I just think in the biological side I mean obviously mm -hmm. it came up in the client in the context of COVID-19 you know with all the world is trying to share the data as fast as we can so there are there are also clear human <laughs> reasons why you know it's literally life-saving reasons why you want to be able to do it. And I suppose the contrast there is that I would spend my life banging my head against the brick wall of archaeology that we think it's acceptable to spend 20 years before we might get round to and no disrespect to the author of this I just use that as a lump of dead tree that isn't <laughs> what I want to be doing for the next 20 years so I'm being provocative and whether there are other other scientists who are also trying to get their data out quicker than the archaeologists. So that wasn't a rant at you, Jesse. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know. Nobody else here seems to be frustrated by the fact that the whole, one of the things I thought we would achieve 20 years ago where we started putting stuff up online, we might actually speed the process. I, I advocate this thing called re-engineering the process. And I think because I've been here for three days, I've been struck that we're still struggling with this hybrid situation. And I can, I know there are reasons why we have hybrid issues, but the data, to me, the data reuse 
is very tied up with our publication model. Now at that point, if Judith doesn't switch on, I don't know if she must have gone and made a cup of tea, but you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there, Julian. But you know, that yeah. no, it's, it's, I don't know, maybe Judith uh, does want to join in, but it, I mean, I share your frustration. I'm a bit more optimistic that things are speeding up because there's certainly paper archives from 30 years ago from archaeological sites, and I won't name the directors online, but you can probably imagine who some of them are, but are, are still not accessible that I would dearly love to get hold of. Um, and I think we are, I think the digital world, world is improving that. And I think there's becoming a greater spirit of um, putting your data online before you've finished with it yourself. And I think that's often the reason why people are reluctant to say, I think, oh, I'm, I'm eventually going to get round to doing something with that. So I don't want to share it because there must be another paper in it. And they never do. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that that there have been a few sort of people who, who've gone against that and are all, all in favour of, of that. Um, I guess that, I mean, we have encountered it, I have to say, in, in um, the heritage science area more broadly. And I think the first archives that ADS were, um, was asked to embargo for a period were actually funded by NERC. And that was a case where people were working on the data and Kieran is online, but I think he was having problems with his sound was was involved in archiving those. And I think that I think they were under a five year embargo. I don't think we generally embargo anything longer than than that, uh, which is is quicker than some with, with some paper archives. Any any other comments on uh, on that? I would just add that at HES, um, we want to make all of our radiocarbon data open and accessible as soon as possible, but do understand that people are quite hesitant about that. So we put a three-year embargo. Basically, you publish your dates within three years, otherwise I'm putting them up on Canmore and they're openly accessible. Um, so that's what we've been doing, but that was only implemented um, in the last couple of years. Yeah, so it's, it, presumably it doesn't apply to legacy projects, but it applies going forward. Yeah, it does. But with legacy projects, I've been going through and chatting to the the people who who have put in the dates because although we pay for them, the, the IPR still rests with with the people who who put in the samples. So I've been chatting to them, and actually, I found them quite amenable to putting the dates up online. To be honest, especially when I'm looking at sites that were dug, kind of early two thousands, late nineties, that kind of time period. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really good move. Um, yeah, I mean, I think C14 dating, in my experience, I'm working with Bryony and I mean, Bryony gave a paper on Monday, on Tuesday as well. And she said, actually, when she went looking for data, it was the C14 data that she found most comprehensive. She couldn't find the related archaeological stratigraphy and phasing data. And, you know, and there's a, there's a, <laughs> there is a big issue around how much data is actually reaching the archives as, as well. You know, you, you want to actually reuse stuff it's got to be there in a, in a consistent and comp comparable way. And I'm, uh, I don't think I can let this whole conversation go over three days without saying I am considerably concerned by what's not reaching the archive. Nothing wrong with what's in, well, there are things, issues about what's in the archive. And we're talking about the issues about what's in there and what we can reuse. So there's, a, there's still a huge issue around making it reusable because half of it at least is not there. Yeah, okay. Well, Can I make a comment following on from Lisa? Please. Um, I really like the initiative of having this kind of embargo if they don't make it immediately available and it's the policy to, to then make it available and then having dialogues with them as well to know that that's a practice. And I think Oxford Radiocarbon Lab maybe do a similar thing as well, but I think they're on a much longer time scale. And I just wanted to say that with this, the Zooms technique, um, the IP also rests, we offer it as a kind of semi-commercial service here at Biowark and... Um, we, the intellectual property does reside with the person who is sending the samples if it is in that, in that kind of system, but we make it clear in the agreement with them that we make it all, the data is available, and then that's part of the kind of condition of the service. And I think it's, um, yeah, like I was saying before in the presentation, really important to kind of have those dialogues before even the, the research project starts to say like, okay, this is the standard practice and this is what we're going to do and it's part of the contract. Um, I actually need to go to another call, so I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to, to everyone and for these really interesting conversations. Yeah. And thank, thank you very much, uh, Jesse. Thank you so much, Jesse.
so I think we yeah we are that reminds me we have reached uh, three o'clock I don't want to shut everything down if um, there were burning topics that people wanted to bring up so just put your camera on if you wanted to wave at me if you wanted to say anything okay I think uh, after well certainly those who've been with us three days are certainly probably exhausted now <laughs> looking forward to an early weekend if they if they can manage it uh, but um, I think it has been a, a, a really good three days I'd like to thank particularly for, for today um, Alejandra and colleagues at UCL and uh, Holly and the broader sort of shock participation that we've had to, today I think we've uh, sort of a useful thing there in bringing shock to the sort of broader attention of an archaeological community that may well not have heard of it uh, before and I think that's quite understandable. Um, it's been very useful for us from an ERIS point of view as well to allow us to develop those recommendations and to add in some more detail. So um, thank you for that. Um, were there any final comments you wanted to make, Holly or Alejandra? Just a massive thank you to everybody. Uh, quite a few people have stuck with us uh, all three days in uh, difficult time zones and just a, a huge thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thank you in, indeed, Alejandra. Um, and I wanted to thank, uh, to thank you, Julian and Holly for all the work that you've done first putting the event together, but then uh, at the second stage of, of lots of work, turning it into, into this, this uh, final online event. So thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you. And I think it has, well, throughout the three days, it's shown, as we said yesterday, both the, the pros in enabling maybe a lot more participation, but also the cons that we can't now go to the pub or elsewhere for a drink. I see there was a, a question posed there about uh, data, which really was a, a, a posed as a question to have in the pub afterwards. But we'll have to do that in a, on another occasion. So uh, final thank you from uh, me. We will circulate details of the, uh, uh, the recording. Uh, the Google Doc will stay shared if you have any afterthoughts that you want to uh, add to that. And a final sort of best wishes and stay safe, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye. I love it. Anyway, everyone's turning their cameras on and waving bye. <laughs> <laughs>